My guest today on the superfluous fifth string is banjo player Pauline Keneally. Originally from Ireland, Pauline grew up in England and is now resident in Chicago. She's a magical storyteller, a wonderful banjo player, and she takes us on a journey through the Irish communities in London in the 1970s and 1980s, right through to how she ended up playing the Grand Ole Opry with Mike Snyder. I hope you enjoy this chat with Pauline Keneally. Delighted to introduce uh, one of my favourite banjo players, uh, Pauline Keneally, who now resides in Chicago. But where are you from originally, Pauline? Well, hello there, Enda Scahill, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. After all this downtime of no facial uh, music people, I love to be with. Anyway, so uh, I come from originally a little place uh, 40 miles north of London called Bedford, Bedford Town. My parents immigrated there in the early 60s. Immigrated from where? My father is uh, a Connemara man from a little village called Erislanen, right near Ballykeneely. And my mother came from County Longford, uh, Edgewood Town she was born in, but she was raised in Newtown Forbes. And did, did, did they bring the music with them? Was that where you got into Irish music? Yes, I was lucky enough. Both parents absolutely loved music. And my mother didn't play but she could lilt and whistle every tune. She was a beautiful dancer, but she was music crazy. And so it was her influence, really, that got us all playing. Yeah, because your whole family plays, I mean, quite famously. Uh, your brother Mick, uh, wonderful fiddle and bazooki player. And you have a sister who plays as well. And maybe there's more, is there? I have an oldest. So the oldest girl is Bernadette, and she's banjo. And do you know Bernadette? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. And then Kathleen plays the whistle, and then Mick's fiddle, and I'm banjo. So the four of us, yes. So uh, that must have been a serious clatter in Bedford back in the... Uh, I, you, I'm too polite to say when. It was, no, thank you very much, 70s. Definitely uh, the 70s. So we were all born in the 60s, but 70s were like, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, and we probably were the only family in Bedford that played traditional Irish music. What the emphasis on traditional Irish music? Because a lot of the lads I went to school with, they used to practice in the lunch hour, but there'd be show band material and, and uh, Irish rock, you know, which was great. But we were the opposite at the time, we thought, you know. What was it like being Irish, playing Irish music in Bedford in the 1970s? Well, in the 70s, our town was full of Irish. So it was a welcomed the certain few landlords that were Irish or uh, hotel owners, they'd have the private room in the back and my father was always playing. And my mother's brother, uh, Willie Vernon, an outstanding box player. And uh, so dad and Willie were the two main men in town for the real traditional music, you know. So we, we, we were welcomed in most um, bars and hotels for music and it was always with your families, of course, so it was people in, you know. And was there a wildness to it? it I, I'm picking that up from you. There was, particularly with like with your dad playing in the pubs and that. Was this? Was it a bit mad? Was it mad? Was it good fun? It was great crack. It was um, early in the early seventies. I mean, um, we were all dancing as well. So most weekends we'd gone to a fish. You know, Kathleen Bernadette and I. Mick refused to dance. <laughs> 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 and dad was the fiddle player for the fishes and the, you know the private Galway Association dinner dances dad was the fiddle player and the girls were the dancers but um there were many many Irish in Bedford but not many of them had the same passion for traditional music but they surely loved all the Irish um country songs as we call it country and western that's what they called it but when we would play they would stand in silence flocked that because they were in a different country, they then realized they loved it more than they remembered because they were not at home anymore. It, the same can uh, be attributed to being in America. I've got lots of Irish friends that would never listen to traditional Irish music. It's not their thing. But now when they hear it in the pub, it's like an anthem to them and they're glued. So Bedford, you know, it's near London, loads of, Country music, which I say, and show band music. Where where did you learn how to play well? Like, where, where, was there music teachers there? Well, well, we were very, very fortunate, and um, 
because dad knew lots of people and every so often he'd go to London to listen to someone play that we that was not going to come through Bedford and he'd pick up a new LP every month and when he'd come in the front door we were like we couldn't I don't know what made us in love with it so much but we could not wait to see what the LP was and who, who'd get to read the sleeve first and we knew we couldn't touch it you know it was it was we just knew that at eight and nine I remember the day he walked in with the Liz Carroll LP her first one Oh my goodness, we, were, we and dad, and she's American. It was hilarious. When we think back, she's the best out there, and she's American. You know, I've told Liz this story many a time. Um, but uh, so teacher-wise, because we had lots of influence from our home, we, we, um, and that's the cat skills, would you believe that, of all times to call me. Um, because we had lots of influence from my mother and father at home. He, my father never watched TV. He played in the kitchen every night. What, what, did he play? what did he play, Pauline? He played the fiddle. He still does. And he's actually a nice little flute player. And he's a lovely button box player. And with a few jars, a nice little singer. <laughs> and not a bad waltzer, as my mother would say, because she was the queen dancer. And he's not a bad waltzer, your father. Not, not too bad at all. Anyway, um, so he was in London one weekend and he met Brenda Mulcair. And he said, I have four children and I think they love music because every time I play, they don't sit in the other room. They come dancing in the kitchen and little Mick, we always called him little Mick because dad was Mick as well. He'd be in the kitchen watching dad like fingers, just watching. It was, it was never, we were never told we had to do any of that playing or dancing. It was just, it was our house. My mother would dance every day. So he said to Brendan, any chance you could um, come to Bedford and teach my four children? So Brendan came down with Mary Conroy at the time, the two of them, they were very young, and um, six foot five son walking behind me. Thank you for help. <laughs> so um, Brendan came down one Saturday morning. He came into our kitchen and he said, no, we had an old fashioned tape recorder. And he said, right. And he gave us three or four tunes on the whistle. He said, and here's the scale. And here's just practice that for a bit. And I'm going to come back in a couple of weeks and see how you're getting on. So we came back in two or three weeks and Kathleen, my sister Kathleen, automatic whistle player. She had the three jigs off with rolls and she'd never been taught before. Whatever she heard, it came out. It, she just loved it and loved it and loved it. Oh my gosh. So Bernadette and I were not very good whistle players, I will tell you that. <laughs> we still laugh to this day, but we learned all the tunes he gave us. And then Mick, of course, played the whistle because he just loved music. So when Brendan came the following month, he had a, a few instruments in the boot of his car. When I say boot, it was a sports car convertible, so it was in the back seat, really. And uh, he said, right, who wants to try this? So um, uh, Mick had dad's fiddle. And that's all we had, one fiddle and four children and four whistles. And my mother was like, well, you better get another instrument because the whistles are going to drive her mental. <laughs> Woo! We're on the kitchen. So Brendan gave us um, a mandolin and a banjo to borrow for a couple of weeks until he came back. And so Kathleen stuck with the whistle, Mick had dad's fiddle and Brendan sat him down and showed him how to hold it and just do four strings, I can still see it. And uh, I want you to practice the scale Mick for a couple of weeks. And when he came back, Mick had wheels and jigs off. So it was in his head already. Because we couldn't read music, of course. And that's how it started. If it wasn't for Brendan Mulcair taking time and absolutely coming to our house once a month for about six months, he came without his influence or help. And then he took me under his wing and God rest his soul when he passed away. It was like an era that will never ever get back because he taught thousands of us. Brenda Mulcair. And, and fortunately those that lived in London had him right there when we were too far away, you know. Yeah. And that's how it started and we kept going. So the, the banjo is a very technical instrument. I think that it's quite a difficult instrument. He wasn't a banjo player, so like, where did you get technique from? Did you did, did it just happen? Oh, Brendan would play the banjo and he'd say, this is exactly what you need in ornamentation. So for an instance, and he'd play nice and steady and he'd say, what do you like? And I said, I like the banjo, you know. Or so I thought when I really picked it up out of the car and played it in the kitchen, I'm like, I like the sound of that, you know. Um, and don't forget now, back those days, there was no VCRs, no nothing on TV to even see anyone play it. It was all records and in your ear. So you, you never saw anyone playing anything. And, um, God, I'm old. 
<laughs> but um, he, I'll never forget this particular tune that he was explaining to us how to play it properly. And he said, and always never rush and slow and steady right hand, always have rhythm. That brings out the tune. If you start going fast and you can't match your left hand and you don't know it, but the, you know, the A part and then the B part. No, all of it slow till you can play the tune at all. And if it takes six months to play it at any speed at all, that's what I want. And it, we listened, we were kids, you know. So the tune was the Dublin Wheel. And he went, da di da. And we knew they were pickup notes or the big, but he had to explain that. And he said, but you know that already. And we're like, oh, well, we, we knew it wasn't the actual tune because of eight bars, even though we were seven and eight. But anyway, so he played da 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 the tune made sense immediately, but when he got to the second part, he goes, okay, so most people do this. He said, record this now. I want you to do this because this will make you think of other variations that might come through another tune. And he went, it was just like that. Every tune he would teach us, he said, think about it for a minute. Don't change the tune. Think of something that would enhance it. And just two little notes. Just changed it to a beautiful piece of music. And that was our love. We, we absolutely loved him and loved music, so we couldn't get enough. And that's where our style comes from, and it's Brendan Mulcair. But, of course, every single day my mother would have a record on, and we'd skip it in through the alleyway. And she said, who's that? So we had to decide, was it Paddy Cloran? Was it James Morrison? Was it Michael Cohn? We had to guess, was Jimmy Killip? We had to guess, Brendan McGlinchey. And she said, um, don't tell me yet, no, listen good. And that's how we learned from the age of six, seven, and eight, which fiddle player with what style is who. That would make a, a great album title. Don't tell me yet, no, listen good. Uh, yeah, don't tell me yet, just listen. You know, it was great. And she, you know, dot, dot, dot. And then she'd swing into a Margot number. There is always a fire or something country and we'd be driving in the kitchen. Every day. We were very, very fortunate to have both parents that loved music with a passion, not wow. just played or danced or loved. They absolutely lived for it. So when you became a teenager then, was there a pressure on you to not play when, you know, being a teenage girl and all the different bits and pieces socially and with other girls and all that kind of stuff. Was that an issue or did you just not care and keep playing? Or was it part of the identity of who you were at the time? I can't remember Bernie Catlin or I ever not wanting to play music, but there was often the night, like we'd always go to the Friday night church hall dance. All of us teenagers. That was the family Irish thing to do on a Friday night. Big show band, The Friendlies. Great name. And the, the drummer would never use the block. He'd always go... And start playing it was fantastic the old memories but right after the dance there'd be probably the hall would be packed 150 people and a lot of those teenagers of irish descent they wouldn't have a clue what a real of a jig was or that we even played music yet right and off to the nightclub would go all of us 15 of us so we'd have one minute pure siege of venice waltzing and jiving straight off to the nightclub to give it the large with the old swing hand you know it, it never stopped us. Music was number one, but we still went to nightclubs and still went to parties. And But music was our life. And most weekends, we were very fortunate at early teenage life to have a brother, thankfully, because he met all these wonderful lads. Joe Malloy, Kevin Crawford, Brendan Boyle, Ivan Militich, Kevin and Des Hurley. I mean, I, I could go on. And he was going down to Birmingham most weekends, Mick was, until one day they said, Mick, do you have any family? And he didn't want to tell them he had three sisters because he thought the minute I bring three sisters into this equation, my music life's over because they're going to fancy them or the girls are going to fancy them. And that was the big joke. So Mick never told them he had sisters. <laughs> Honestly, God. So we all ended up going to Birmingham one weekend and that was our life changed. Our life changed. The music was outstanding. Patsy Maloney. Um, the Malloys. Paddy and, Paddy and Emily came from a little village called Cashel in Galway, Connemara. And um, they had a three-story house in Birmingham in Spark Hill. And upstairs were the girls and downstairs were the boys every weekend, apart from when they came to our house in Bedford. Girls up, boys down. Mum would squeeze about 15 people in. Just all musicians, 
from all over. Great. She'd cook breakfast for everyone, so would Mrs. Malloy. We didn't need nightclubs and friends that didn't accept that we played music because our real friends were right there. It sounds like a non-stop uh, flack hill. You wouldn't believe my house. My, oh, my God, rest my mother. Oh, and, and Malloy, God rest her as well. She would accept, uh, welcome all of us. And every, um, every Friday, Saturday, it was 24 hours of music. Off to the nightclub, the Akafez, back to the Malloys. And we were always safe because we had so many male guards around us. You know what I mean? Um, we were all best, best friends. We used to go to uh, the Flack Hill together, the Willie Clancy together. There was 19 of us in a room once in the Willie Clancy week. I'll never forget it. <laughs> so did you go back and over to Ireland very often then? No. It was very expensive. My parents didn't have that kind of money. We didn't have instruments yet. Don't forget that. They were borrowed. And um, the honest truth is, I think I was six or seven. I was dancing and mum won bingo, I think. And the next day, we all went to Ireland. The next day. Yeah, that was it. Because you were going to meet my parents if it kills me. Because not everyone had a a contractor dad or a... Some of them were just simple labourers that never really made it off that path. But music kept them going. Do you know what I mean? Wow. So when mm. did you get your first banjo? My sister Bernadette, actually, when she moved to Dublin, found me a little banjo. When she left home, I had no instrument. And I used to cry all the time. It was awful. I missed them. Bernie and Kathy moved to Ireland and I was still at school. But um, she came back one weekend with a little banjo. And there wasn't even a name on it. I don't even know where she got it from. It was just something to... Um, play around on and uh, I bought myself my first banjo when I came to America at 21. Wow so you're 21 and you moved to America how did that yes. come about? I was a dancer <laughs> believe that or not I was an Irish dancer in, in England and um, they chose me to represent Ireland on one of those cultist tours back in 1988 when I was 20 and um, I did a couple of English tours and, and then they asked me to go to America and by golly when I got off that plane and entered my first concert hall in New York I knew my heart and soul I think America's for me it's like that I just <laughs> knew the people I met the music but I didn't know where I was going to live in America so of course we traveled to all those different states with the, with the tour but um, one night and this is what made my decision to come back. And I chose Chicago. I was 20 and I was having a, well, I should have been 21, but you can have a beer at 18 at home. So we're having a beer in a Chicago in a bar called the Abbey, which I'm thinking you might remember, maybe not. And um, it was our night off. Um, so the Abbey bar was ran by a Clare man and a Mayo woman, husband and wife, Breed and Tom Looney, and they always had traditional music in there. So that we were told, and tonight there's going to be traditional music, but it wasn't advertised to. And when I walked in the door, I nearly had a heart attack. Who was playing? Liz Carroll and Marty Fahey on the piano. I thought I was in a dream world because all I ever saw was the album cover where she's sitting on the piano like that. And he had hair then. <laughs> I always say to Marty, when I first remember seeing you, I thought, that can't be you, because the guy on the album has jet black hair, but it was him. And I sat for two hours listening to them play, and my heart was absolutely elevated. I couldn't even tell you, God, this is... And we didn't have a phone, so I couldn't call my mother to tell her, guess who I'm listening to, you know? So that's why I chose Chicago. I knew there'd be great people, great music. And sure enough, every weekend, I didn't know anybody. I just came by myself. But um, I went to the Irish Centre and went to every Cayley to meet all the young and old, to see who they were. And here I am 31 years later. So what, what was your first banjo? My first banjo was a 1926 Gibson Mastertone. It's a good starting point. Yes, it was beautiful. And um, it was $400 back in 1989. And I didn't have $400. So the guy who sold it to me from his five, it was five string banjo shop. That was the only four string he had. And um, it, was, it wasn't in bad shape. I had to get the neck fixed, but it was, it was a nice little sound. I had to pay 50 bucks a week. But every Saturday morning, I'd go into his store and I would sit in the back room, headphones on and plug it in and play for three hours because I didn't have anything to play. And um, 
on the fourth week. I was only $200 in now, don't forget. <laughs> I still owed another 200. He said, I trust you and I know you'll come back with the payment. Take it home. I can't bear to see you sit there and then leave it. I said, are you sure you can trust me? I'll leave you my driver's license. He said, I know where you live, don't worry. And I came back every Saturday and for 20 years, I bought my strings, my plectrums, anything I needed for my banjo from him as a thank you. He was very kind to do that for me. Wow. Do you, what, what shop was that? Hog Eye Music on the south side of Chicago. That's a great story. Yeah, it's real. True story. Yeah. Do you, st do you still have that banjo? Do you know, I actually sold it uh, a year ago because I have a Dave Boyle and I've got my lovely um, uh, menu own. So I, I didn't see the need for three. My children don't play. So I thought, uh, and there was a young girl in Chicago who's banjo mad and she really wanted to find a banjo. And I said, you know what? I have one. No point getting dust. She's a gorgeous little player. Great kid. Let someone else get some love out of it. I assume you sold it for more than four hundred dollars. I did, yes. Yeah. So you have an Ohm and you have a Dave Boyle. Dave Boyle passed away last year. I know. I never met the man. I never met him, but my sister Bernadette was a great friend, and that that Dave Boyle was a wedding gift from my family, from my father and sisters and brother. Wow. I don't think the husband was pressed, you know, too <laughs> happy with that gift. <laughs> <laughs> was he hoping for a bit of land or something? I don't know, because I think on our honeymoon, that didn't work out either. I remember landing in Clare, having a great tune with John Blake, and it was my honeymoon, and the poor guy was sitting there, I thought, like, I'm terrible. <laughs> he obviously, he wasn't a musician. Oh, no. Yeah, so the Ohm. Oh, that's an amazing story, how I got that. Um, so about... Four years ago, or maybe 2014, so six maybe, I don't know how many years ago, five, I was asked to teach at this beautiful camp in um, just outside Nashville called Pegram. And it is the Fiddle and Pick beautiful music store owned by Tim and Gretchen, Gretchen Priest and Tim May. Tim May is an amazing songwriter, guitarist, uh, Grammy nominee. He's a great, great man and makes the most beautiful instruments and his wife Gretchen um, is a lovely fiddle player old timey and Irish and singer so they hired me to teach uh, this four day camp so uh, I got this email about four weeks before the camp asking um, hey Pauline my name is Mike I'm going to be in your class I'm wondering are you teaching any tunes off your CD because I'd like to listen to them, so when I get to you, I'll have... I said, oh, no problem at all. Um, oh, sorry, I'm lying. Sorry, he said, I see all you on YouTube. I want to know where to get the uh, uh, CD from. And I said, I can mail you one. He said, so my website wasn't up yet. And um, he said, no, 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 no. I said, listen, you're coming to my class. Absolutely no problem. I just mailed it to him, the CD. Very, very nice guy. Turn. He turns up at the class the morning we start teaching. And he's got an ohm banjo. And I asked everyone to play a tune so I know where everyone's at. And he played a tune. I'm like, bloody hell, he doesn't need to be here at all. He's a great musician. Whoever this fuck is, you know, who the hell is he? And uh, it was great. I said, that's a really lovely banjo playing. So I spent the whole morning with these other three people. And um, I said, you know what? The class is going to be over. But you and I are going to spend the whole lunch hour. I don't need to eat. I said, because you're not getting your worth because they're way behind you. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't fair. He said, you don't have to do that. I said, I do. I said, because you're the guy who emailed me, right? He said, I am. So we spent the whole lunch hour together. And the afternoon, I then spent with him and the others, watched a bit because they were learning a lot from him being able to play, blah, 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 blah. The next thing, um, the end of the day is there. And he says, Pauline, come over here and sit with me and play a tune on the bench outside the fiddle and pick. Great. So I started playing um, a tune. And he took, out, he took out his five-string banjo and started backing, and it was just gorgeous. And I said, oh, my God, this is beautiful. I wish I knew you before I made me CD, whatever. So anyway, it turns out, he says, come on, get in the car. And I said, well, where are we going? He said, I'd like you to open the Grand Ole Opry for me tonight. And I'm like, oh, whatever. Yeah, I thought he was taking the mick. He had a pair of overalls on, chewing 
tobacco and a baseball hat, gentleman. And I said, I can't even leave the camp. But first of all, I don't know who you are. You could be a weird old man who puts me in a car. I'm sorry, I can't go. <laughs> and he starts laughing. And with that, Gretchen Priest comes around the corner. She goes, did I hear right? Mike just asked you to go to the Opry and you won't get in the car because you don't know who he is. She goes, God damn girl, get in that car. It's okay, I'll cover for you tonight. I said, who is he? She's like, you'll find out soon enough. I had no idea. It was Mike Snyder, the one and only. So Mike's laughing all the way in the car to the Grand Ole Opry. And I'm still thinking, I'm not really going to the Opry. I was. Back door, passed in. Mr. God himself walks in because everyone respects him so highly, of course. He's a wonderful person. And anyway, we sat in the changing rooms and we, we rehearsed for 10 minutes and opened the first half, opened the second half. Crystal Gale, uh, Charlie Daniels. Um, he then flew me uh, a few months later to open for Vince Gill. And um, who was the other person? I can't remember. Oh my God, I've gone blank. Crystal, oh, Crystal Gale, Vince Gill and Charlie Daniels. And um, each time they flew me in, put me up at the Opry Hotel. Really kind of him because he just loved my Irish banjo playing. I'm like, wow, we don't go to Ireland and hear the rest of them then. <laughs> I felt like saying, just stay where you are and don't listen to anyone else, you'll be fine. But anyway, um, my last time playing at the Opry, and those moments were absolutely outstanding because he was a gentleman and made you feel like you were the best musician ever. He has that way about him. And your band member was the guitar player the last time I played. Dave. Dave, he asked me, he said, you know that guy from Ireland who plays in that banjo band? He lives here now. I said, call him. He came back. And that's when Dave got the phone call and met him behind stage. He's like, thanks very much. I said, no, thank you. So that's, Dave and I did that. But um, so it was after that gig, I was, uh, we were just having a little jam, as they call it, in the changing room. And Vince Gill was at the door. Oh, my gosh, it was amazing. Hi, Vince. I mean, well, I love him. And... Uh, he said, wow, wham, wham, that band your hand right there. you got a nice rhythm going on there. I'm like, <laughs> it was lovely, you know. So Mike then said to me, Pauline, I think, I really think this banjo belongs in your hands. And I said, I can't afford that right now. I have four children. College is coming up. <laughs> and he says, I'm going to hold on to it for you. Take as long as you need to save up. And he gave me the price, which was way, way, way less than what he paid for it. And I had it um, nine months later. I saved and saved and saved all my gig money. <laughs> like a child with four children, but they should have come first. But this was a very special... Um, who gets offered that? And who, who made it? I don't know who actually makes the own banjo. I should Google it and read up myself, shouldn't I? Have, have yeah. you got it close by? I do, yeah. Got to stand up slowly. Hold on. Give us a look. <clears throat> so that's the beautiful neck on it wow. and the body. So, what does it sound like? I'll give you a quick sound. Oh, I like it, and I love. I love mostly the weight is is effortless. Not a big chunk. to it it sounds but wonderful anyway so yes i love it and so um he mailed it to me and we talk we talk now and again and uh when things are when things are good but pauline you're welcome at the opera anytime you call me and just say how does next weekend sound and i'll say there's a slot for you i just join them and i love that that's amazing that's an amazing story so lucky uh, the, the night he introduced me for the first time, he's like, I've got this very special woman here tonight, and she sounds funny when she talks. But what's really funny is her name sounds like a disease, Pauline Keneally. He'd never heard a name like that before, you see. He thought it was hilarious. 
What was it like to play Irish music in the Opry? 4,000 people. And um, they went crazy because everyone loves Irish music. But most people love banjo, as you know that. You, you have experienced that trifold, you know. Um, it was great. And he would say to me, I want you to play a tune in A minor and then D. And when you change into the D tune, the mandolin's going to come in, the upright bass is going to come in, the two country fiddlers are going to come in. Oh, my God, it was fantastic. It was, it was amazing. But I need, to go, I need to buy the backstrap you have for okay. my next opera appearance because I'm not going to sit down like I always do. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, it was an amazing feeling. And uh, he puts you right there. You're playing, and there's nine people right behind you. Uh, he's just a gentleman, and he speaks so highly of all of his band members and the crew. Oh, the crew were amazing. That was an eye opener. I walked on, and in second, six people, chair, cable, brother, 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 but down, sound check out. I don't, didn't take two minutes. It was amazing. Yeah, blew my mind. <laughs> and it was, we had, we had a, a celebratory um, bourbon shot. I don't do bourbon or shots or whiskey or anything like that. Glass of wine is it? And so you're going to have to have one leads with us right here now because it's just a celebrity shot. The first hour banjo on the stage. Come on! And we, uh, it was just mind blowing that they were so gentlemanly and kind and loved yeah. Irish music. Wonderful. So, did you uh, did you play a lot in Chicago? Did you do a lot of gigs? Um, I have played a lot over the years. I have played a lot, but you know, even in Chicago. The trad music isn't high up as the um, Irish rock would be. So most bars want the drum kit, the, you know, the beautiful songs that I don't play. I mean, I can play along with, but I wouldn't get a gig for that. Do you know what I mean? The two people, giggers, keyboards and the singer. Yeah. yeah. So I've played a lot, uh, but mostly out of town, actually. A lot um, out of Chicago. When, when did you bring out your album? 2016. I, um, I actually wasn't, I didn't know what I was going to do, but you know when you do all these festivals and you get all these little uh, weekend shop workshops and the Catskills and, and, the, and the Seattle camps and all over the place, and I was the only one that didn't have something to sell, and they kept saying, Pauline, please make something, we need to promote it. And I need a bio and I need this. And I thought I'm heavily bogged down with four children right now. I haven't got time to do any of that because they come first and school is very important, et cetera, et cetera. So this is no word of a lie. Um, the children went away for a week. Uh, I didn't know they were going like till a week beforehand with them, their, their dad. And, uh, uh, I called my dad and I said, Dad, I'm going to come home to you for a week because I'm by myself. I can just fly and go. I said, but I'll be there for like four days and I think I'm going to cut a few tracks. But just so if you hear that I'm in Ireland, I am coming to you, but I'm doing something before I get to you. Because you know the way you land home, where is she? I'm somewhere else for four days. Well, I was in Colm Gannon's kitchen in Connemara in Drim and John Blake and John Carty, God love them, I called them four days before and I said, is there any chance you could help me out? And they said, no problem. So I went to Colin Gannon's kitchen and I just played what was in my head at that time. And 10 tracks were done in Colin's kitchen in one day. <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell by the album, I, I just had to do it. And this was my only ever chance that wasn't going to cost me thousands of dollars for one in a studio in Chicago. And John Blake doesn't live here. And... Do you know what I mean? So or my brother doesn't live here, so it would have been expensive tracking and double tracking. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to do it and let's get going. So I did it in a couple of days. And that's exactly how I made the album. And John Blake was extremely gracious and cost effective. And so John Carty helped with the couple of sets. It was great. I was very lucky. Yeah. Will you do another one? Oh, when the kids go to college, I might consider that. I've got another six months and all four will be gone. The <laughs> twins are now 18, so they'll be going to Manhattan and to Wisconsin in August. Wow. So you'll have all of this time to fly up and down to Nashville to play in the Opry. Once a year is good. Just as long as I just do it once a year. 
So would you consider yourself a banjo nerd in any fashion? A banjo nerd? Um, no. 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 I'm, trying, I'm trying to think of the, the nerd bit. No. I don't think of myself as a banjo nerd. You strike me as somebody that had, you know, found a pick that they liked in 1987 and hasn't changed since. Is that fair? Yes. Kind of, kind of. I've had maybe three in my lifetime. And, and yes, I have to have a certain strength. And a, yeah. Do you, three actual picks or three different types? Three different types I've actually used, not more than, because I can only use a heavy gauge string and a, a thicker pick too. So what kind of, what, uh, what gauge pick do you use? Um, it's, well, it's, I like the non-slip 88 millimeter uh, Dunlop now and again, if I can get hold of them. But these little um, USA, these are 80, I can't see without my glasses, 80 millimeters. They're little, I've got these in Nashville. That's the best pick I've ever had. It never breaks or bends and it's always got a solid sound off it and a great grip. So Simple things in life. That would be my Christmas present now, picks and strings. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What, kind of, what kind of strings do you like? There had to be a heavy gauge. So I think I use um, 36, 28, 22, 18, something like that, if I, if I mm. remember correctly. Yeah. That's pretty – yeah, that is heavy. And do you have any preference on, on, on phosphor bronze versus nickel versus bronze? or? Uh. Uh, not the Foster Bronze, no, the other one. Just the nickel regular bronze. Yeah. yeah, yeah, regular. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not actually – the but the worst thing about me is um, I could never fix my own banjo, which is a terrible thing. I could never um, fix the post, or if it's out of tune, I've got to send it somewhere rather than have it at home and take it apart. I am no good when it comes to that. Yeah, I was like that for years. I didn't even know what the different parts of it were named. And I wrote a book, I wrote two books, and hilariously, my first book on the banjo has a diagram of the banjo and then little lines that name all the parts of the banjo. And by accident, I got them right. I was actually pointing at one part of the banjo and called it the resonator. Uh, I thought it was a different part. <laughs> well, I, all I know is resonator. <laughs> resonator is all I know. Well, I've learned them all off since. Well... I wish I knew half as much as anyone else that plays a banjo, but I don't know that much. I just love to play. I'm very, I'm a very simple playing Jane person. I don't go into um, maybe because I don't have the time. Maybe I've been busy, busy for the last ten years, but um, no. What What would be apart from the Opry, which sounds like a a life a lifelong experience? What do you have a dream session or a dream gig that you would absolutely love? I'm thinking in the Irish context. Oh, I'd love to do all those Celtic connections because I know I'd meet all my friends there, stuff like that. Um, I haven't got a dream. I mean, everyone's got their dream team session, but you, you can get loads of them with lots of different connections of people. Um, dream gig. I would love to do a tour of Australia and New Zealand because I know they'd appreciate Irish music. But you have to be with the right lineup, you know, to come across to every genre to like the singing and the dancing so yeah i'd just like to do a couple more tours just to uh of, of different parts of the world before i dropped it you know, all together <laughs> i'd like to do that yeah i'd love to be in australia and new zealand right now because you can you know go outside and meet other people that sounds pretty nice yes it does but yeah no i'm not a banjo nerd my my, my real love of music is fiddle music would you believe that okay do you wish you were a fiddler? I don't wish I was, no, because I, I know my heart and soul, I don't have it in me. Um, you, have, you see when people pick up an instrument, whether they've got that natural hold for it or not. And I definitely was not a bow person. My father, God love me, would say, okay, good God, he says, put the banjo off, she said, because they're not holding that ball right at all. <laughs> he knew by looking. And just taking one look at the whole get up of your, and you know, you're not a fiddle player. Thank God. <laughs> I'm sure I could have been a great fiddle player if I was given one at eight. Like everyone else is, but we weren't even given the option. Paulina, I'm I'm laughing because I'm thinking I might have to subtitle parts of this. <laughs> <laughs> subtitle. Oh my god! We were very. I mean, imagine in the seventies in London, Dad would take us on a train. 
when he had the money saved up and he would take us into the the White Heart or um, we'd sit in the corner, one bottle of Coke, four packets of crisps. We wouldn't budge for three hours. Bobby Casey, Raymond Rowland, John Bow, a friend of Malkia was there, of course. Uh, John Carty was the young one. Um, uh, oh, what was that beautiful flute player called from Connemara? Um, I can't think of his name. Colin Folan. Um, there was lots of great music. Oh my gosh, the hairs on the back of your neck would stand. And unlike today, people would walk in and no one would get the instruments out. They would stand and listen to greatness, you know, hear it first, just stand and watch and listen to what it's all about. And sadly today, everyone just jumps in before they even know what you're playing rather than learning something. I mean, I would never just jump in. I want to listen for two hours first. Do you know what I mean? But those days are gone. But I remember that distinctly. Mm -hmm.